Good morning, afternoon, or evening. Welcome back to Mr. Moore's Algebra 2 class. Today we're going to talk about the property of real numbers, guys. And before I talk to you guys about the properties of real numbers, i got to explain to you, I think, in my opinion, what numbers are, what kind of numbers we have. Real numbers, my brothers, are any rational or irrational number not imaginary. There is something called an imaginary number and we will talk about that. But a real number basically is just any number that's not imaginary. So any rational or irrational number. Okay, so that's great Mr. Moore. What is a rational number? A rational number guys is any number that can be written in A over B form or in fraction form. What will they include? Of course, any fraction mixed number. But they will include natural numbers, which we will define, whole numbers, which we will define, integers, which we will define, repeating decimals. Repeating decimals are decimals that, I'm not being sarcastic, they repeat. For example, 0 0.3737. That's repeating forever. That is rational. And also terminating decimals are rational. Terminating decimals will be something like this, 0.375, where it ends, it terminates. And also perfect squares are included as rational numbers. Perfect squares would be like the square root of 4, square root of 9, square root of 100, okay? And those are rational numbers. Rational numbers are almost everything. <laughs> They just don't include two types, and I'll show you that in a second. So a real number is a rational or irrational, and rational numbers are any number that can be written in a fraction form, and they include natural numbers, whole numbers, integers, repeating decimals, terminating decimals, and perfect squares. Yes, sir? Um, fractions, like, uh, one over three. fractions of 1 over 3 or 3 over 1 or 2 and 1 third, those are all fractions and mixed numbers. Those are rational numbers. Okay, if it's a repeating decimal, it's still a rational number. Like, for example, three-fourths. That's a rational number. You can turn that into a decimal. It's 0.75. That's a terminating decimal. It's a rational number. As long as you can write the number as a fraction, it's rational. And you can write repeating decimals and terminating decimals as a fraction. So it's rational. Thank you, my man. Good question, sir. Okay, natural numbers. Natural numbers are also known as counting numbers, guys, and they're just simply whole values not including zero. So that means that it's the one and the two, the three, four, five, six, seven. Not the in-between stuff. Natural numbers do not include decimals or fractions. Natural numbers are literally whole values not including zero. Whole numbers. Whole numbers are natural numbers including zero. So what does that mean? That means they're whole units greater than or equal to zero. So zero, one, two, three, four, etc., etc. Those are whole numbers. They're the natural numbers, including zero. No fractions, no decimals. None. Hence, I'm not trying to be sarcastic, but that's why they're called whole, because it's a whole unit. No fractions, no decimals, gentlemen. Integers. Integers are whole numbers, and they're opposites. So whole numbers we just discussed would be 0, 1, 2, 3, and they're opposites, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. No fractions, no decimals. So all of those are rational numbers. What are not rational? Well, they're called irrational numbers. And irrational numbers are numbers that cannot be written in A over B form, or in other words, in fraction form. Irrationals include non-perfect squares, 
such as square root of 5 or square root of 8 or square root of 17 or square root of 20. Those are non-perfect squares. Those are irrational. And also non-repeating and non-terminating decimals are irrational. For example, here, this is 2.543255677. There's no rhyme or reason here. It's not repeating, and it doesn't end, just like pi. Yes, sir, my brother. We have a, we have a fraction. It's not irrational, but if we divide it, we can make it irrational. No, if you have a fraction, it's always rational. You cannot turn this into a fraction. That's the whole point. If you have a fraction, it's rational. You can never turn a rational into an irrational, and vice versa. I can never turn this into a rational. It's irrational. It's non-terminating, non-repeating. If the decimal repeats, my man, it's rational. If the decimal terminates, my man, it's rational. If it does not repeat and not terminate, it's irrational. So instead of just random numbers, irrational. Random numbers. I don't know what that means. Random numbers doesn't mean anything to me because I can say... 1274, that's rational. But if I go 1.216632142199328, never ends and never repeats, it's irrational. Just like pi. Thank you, my man. Yes, sir. Like, okay, that's why I did that on purpose. Like these two fives here. It's not a constant repeat, so that it's not considered a repeating decimal. Then it is rational. What he's saying is, let's say you have 0 0.8, 3, 6, 9, 2, but then 5, 5, 5, 5. That's rational. Because it repeated. Thank you, my brother. Okay. Your school is sponsoring a charity race. Which set of numbers best descri describes the number of people, P, who participate in the race? Of the numbers we just learned, what number set would most represent, would best represent human beings, people, in the race? Yes, sir. No, because rational can include 1.6. You don't have 1.6 of a person. Whole, no, because you can't have zero. Natural numbers. Very good. Since there has to be at least one person, the answer would be natural numbers. Since whole numbers include zero, whole numbers would not be correct. Example two. In example one, if each participant made a donation D of $25.75 to a local charity, which subset of real numbers best describes the amount raised? Sir, sir, rational numbers. How do you know, Mr. Morrow, so quickly? Is that not a terminating decimal? So they would have to be rational numbers. Since those donations will most likely have a decimal value, the answer would be rational numbers. Does that make sense, my brother? Promise? Thank you, my man. Okay, now let's talk about a couple things here. The opposite or additive inverse of any number A is negative A. The sum of a number and its opposite is zero, which is the additive identity. All I need you to understand is when you add a number and its opposite, you will get zero. This is what allows you to solve equations. For example, if you have x plus 4 equals 9, and I subtract 4 to both sides, that, that is allowable because of the additive inverse. There's also something called the multiplicative inverse. And the multiplicative inverse, the reciprocal or multiplicative inverse of any non-zero number a is 1 over a. Okay? The product of a number and its reciprocal is 1. The multiplicative identity, that is what it's called, or multiplicative inverse, either way. Let me explain how this works. If I have 8, isn't there an invisible 1 here? Well, if I multiply a value times its reciprocal, the 8's cancel, and I have 1. 
negative 5. The multiplicative inverse of that or the multiplicative identity of that is negative 1 over 5 because it's an invisible 1. And if I multiply a value by its reciprocal, the answer will be 1. Why, Mr. Morrill? The negatives cancel because the negative to the negative is a positive, and the fives cancel, and I'm left with 1. Does that make sense, guys? Very important. Now, properties of real numbers. Let A, B, and C be real numbers, variables, or algebraic expressions. The commutative property of addition. A plus B equals B plus A. What is this telling you? This is saying that the order of an addition problem or of a multiplication, as you can see, is commutative both addition and multiplication. The, the order does not change the value. You can switch around the order for the commutative property of addition and multiplication problems only, and it will not change the value. For example, four plus, 3 plus 4 is 7. That equals 4 plus 3, which is 7. 3 times 4 is 12, which equals 4 times 3, which is 12. Okay. One second, please. Okay, sorry about that. So, the associative property. The associative property of addition and also of multiplication. The associative property works for both. And what the associative property states is A plus parentheses B plus C equals A plus B in parentheses plus C. So what happens here is you can change the grouping symbols of an addition or multiplication problem and not change the value. For example, 3 plus parentheses 4 plus 5 is equal to parentheses 3 plus 5 plus 4. Notice that this is different from the commutative property because if you can tell here, guys, in this one I had the 4 and 5 in the parentheses. Well, in this one I have the 3 and 5 in parentheses. So whenever I pull a value out of the parentheses, that indicates associative property. Just like here. I took the 4 out out of the parentheses so that indicates associative property. Distributive property. The distributive property states that A times B plus or minus C will equal A times B plus or minus A times C. You are going to multiply the outside value to everything inside of the parentheses. It does not matter if it's on the left side or on the right side. Here, this F will be multiplied to everything inside the parentheses. Numerically speaking, let's say I have 2 times 3 plus 4. This is 2 times 3 plus 2 times 4. If I have 5 minus 3 in parentheses times 2, this is 2 times 5 minus 2 times 3. Okay, that's the distributive property. The identity property of addition. The identity, when you think of identity, think of looking at yourself in the mirror. Okay? Any number added to zero will be itself. So the identity property of addition is A plus zero equals A. Or in other words, in numerically speaking, five plus zero is five. The identity property of multiplication states that any number times one is itself. So A times one is a, or in other words, numerically speaking, 5 times 1 is 5. The additive inverse property, we already went over that. The additive inverse, any number plus its opposite is 0. So, for example, 8 plus a negative 8 is 0. The multiplicative inverse property, the multiplicative inverse property, we already looked at that as well. Any number times its reciprocal will equal 1. So A times 1 over A equals 1. Numerically speaking, 3 times 1 over 3 equals 1. Zero property. The zero property states that anything times 0 is 0. Okay? So A times 0 equals 0. Numerically speaking, 6 times 0 equals 0. 
And then the closure property of both addition and of multiplication. The closure property simply states that the sum of two real numbers will give you a real number sum. For example, 3 plus 5. 3 and 5 are both real numbers. That equals 8, which is a real number. And the closure property of multiplication is the same concept. A real number times a real number is a real number. So A times B equals a real number. Numerically speaking, 4 times 2, 4 and 2 are both real numbers. That equals 8, which is a real number. And those are the properties that we need to know. Okay, which property does each equation illustrate? All right, let's see. I got negative 2 over 3 times 3 over negative 2. What do you think that is? Think about it. I'm multiplying a value times its reciprocal. Well, if you said inverse property of multiplication or multiplicative inverse, that would have worked. I got 2 times 3 times 5, but 2 and 3 in the parentheses. And I got 3 times 2 times 5, but 3 and 2 are still in the parentheses. If you notice, I just changed the order here. I did not take anything out of the parentheses. So this would be, um, actually, this is wrong. This would be the commutative because I did not, I did not take anything out of the parentheses. That would be commutative. How about here? 3 times f plus r in parentheses plus 13 equals 3f plus 3r plus 13. I think I multiplied the 3 to both the f and the r, so that would have to be the distributive property. Now, 3 plus 8 in parentheses plus 9 equals 9 plus 8 in parentheses plus 3. If you notice, I took the 3 out of the parentheses. So whenever I take something out of the parentheses, I'm talking about the associative property. And in this case, it's of addition because I'm adding. And now, let's use the properties of real numbers to show that a plus parentheses 4 plus negative a close parentheses equals 4. Okay? Well, first off, if I have a plus 4 plus negative a in parentheses, I can, first of all, use the commutative property and rearrange. Um, and this is, the, I made a little error here, and I apologize. This should be a 3, this should be a 3, and that should be a 3. My bad, no excuse. But if you notice, I switched the negative a for the 3 here. I just switch the order, so that's why I have the commutative property of addition. Okay. Next, I have the associative property of addition. Why? I brought this A into my parentheses. So whenever I take something out or put something into parentheses, it is the associative property of addition in this case because they're being added. Then I have, if I take a plus a negative a, it gives me 0. When I add a number and its opposite, it equals 0. That is the additive inverse property. And then 0 plus 3, they're both real numbers. It equals 3, which is a real number. And that would be closure. And that's it, my friends. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day. And I hope you learned a lot. Take care and bye-bye.